a theme which comes up very often, I think, uh, when, when I'm preaching anyway, is the idea of understanding our faith as adults. Just, it's something that, that I come across almost every day, that uh, even with, with young adults or maybe people even into their 50s and 60s, uh, faith formation often stopped at confirmation. So uh, they may not have an, an adult's understanding of the faith at all. So they learn the faith, and as you need to do, you need to adapt the understanding of the faith to, to a child's level, so you keep things nice and simple. Uh, but then uh, we don't get an understanding of the faith from the perspective of an adult later on in life as we should. The danger with that then is that our understanding of faith can be quite childish and then doesn't stand up to the rigor of, of real life and of examination. So um, it's very interesting when we look at, at Gospels from the perspective of, of adults. And every now and again, just to kind of dive in a little deeper, we have, we have two younger people with us here today, but I'll try and keep them on board as well. But it is important to look at these things also from the perspective of adults. So uh, Jesus speaks very, very clearly, right? Jesus speaks very actually bluntly at times. Now, the way we learn about our faith in, in primary school is that, you know, Jesus is, is good and kind and merciful and gentle and all that kind of thing, which is true, but he's also just, you know, and he's also, while merciful, he's able to tell people off when they're out of line for their good, okay? Uh, he also speaks quite a lot about the devil and hell. Jesus does. This isn't me now. This isn't the church of the 50s or anything. Like, this is, this is, this is what Jesus says, right? So, in the gospel of today, and Jesus speaks about the sower, okay? So the sower goes out to, to sow his seed. Some of the seed lands on the edge of the path. Birds of the air come down and eat that seed. Who are the birds of the air? They are the demons. Jesus says so, right? So Jesus speaks about the fact that there's a spiritual battle going on around us, okay? This, is, this, this, isn't, a, this isn't a game. This is serious stuff. And there are, there's the enemy out there who wants to take this word from my heart. Uh, a number of years ago, I was on a flight to Slovakia, and I was sitting beside a, a, an Austrian girl. She was flying into Bratislava to, to, to drive back to Vienna. And I was just, just talking to her about how things were in Ireland, and we, we were over on holidays or working. She said, oh, I work in Ireland. I said, great. I said, what do you work at? And she said, I work in marketing. And I said, fantastic. And then I just thought, what would you do? What, would, what kind of tactic would you have if you had to market the church. I don't know where the question came from, because I never really thought about it, but it just, when I was talking to her, I said, like, if you had to market the church, what would you do? And she said, well, in, in standard marketing practice, any product that you advertise, anything that you want to sell, has to have a unique selling point, what they call a USP, unique selling point, right? Like, why do you buy Mercedes? Well, you buy them because they're, they're comfortable, they have wooden interior and leather seats. Um, why do you buy Toyotas? Because they're very, very reliable. Why do you buy Lamborghinis? Because they are insane. You know what I mean? But like, there's, there are reasons to buy different cars. You know, you don't buy a Lamborghini to pull a trailer. Uh, you know, everyone, everyone knows that, okay. Uh, so, point being, like, it, it, all cars have a unique, even like, for example, I won't go too much into this, but the Volkswagen Group, they own Seat, Volkswagen, Audi, Lamborghini, and a couple of others. But those cars don't compete with each other. Seat, they're for kind of your younger drivers. Uh, Volkswagen, they're for your farmers. D down the road, solid, out, good, good, good quality cars. Uh, Skoda's in, same, similar to that, just a small bit cheaper. Audi's then, they're your business executives, right? Slightly more upmarket, okay? And then your Lamborghini's, same, the same opening and closing window switches, but apart from that, absolutely insane. They're for your soccer players and your, you know. But, they're all owned by the same company, but they know not to compete with each other. Okay, you get the point. Unique selling point, right? Each, each group, each car is aiming at a slightly different part of the market. Okay? That's how business works. Okay. Apply that to our faith. What is the unique selling point of our faith? This, this question came to me when I was in, in, in that flight. What is the unique selling point? Or she asked me, actually. What's the unique selling point of the Catholic Church? And I just thought, Mamma Mia. We've been, for the last 30 years, we've been telling people that there's nothing unique about the church at all. That what's important is that you have some belief, you have some belief in God, there's some belief in, a, in, a, in an afterlife or a higher power or something. And once you've, you believe in something, you're, you're, you're grand, you're a good person, you've, you're, you're, you're spiritual, okay? And fill in the blanks with whatever you want. Now that is absolute rubbish. 
Okay? And not only is it rubbish, that's absolutely, and pardon the bluntness of my expression, but that is absolutely diabolical. Because anything that messes around, that plays with or risks your eternal salvation is diabolical. And to tell people that all religions are the same is absolute rubbish, right? If you, look, if you'll find a poster somewhere, right? Look them up on, on Google them afterwards. Compare world religions. They're completely different. And ask Muslims, are all world religions the same? They won't, they won't, they don't think so, okay? Ask Protestants, are you the same as Catholics? I, I, I don't think so, okay? Ask, 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 your, ask your, your Buddhists and your Hindus, are all world religions, ask Mormons, are all world religions the same? Nobody thinks that. No other world religion thinks that. Where, how on earth did, did that become popular in the church? Dare I say, it's actual cowardice. It's just plain cowardice. If I were to say, hello lads and ladies, this is my dear wife, she's, she's amazing, she's beautiful, but I don't want to look like I'm partial in any way, so all women, all women are beautiful, all women are, are amazing and equally as amazing as, as my wife, but you're all, you're all beautiful in your own way. Will I be applauded now for my openness to all women or will I be kind of scorned and definitely kicked or elbowed um, by herself for my lack of courage in saying, this is my wife and I love her. It doesn't mean I hate all of ye, right? I don't hate every other woman in the world, but this is my wife. So I'm allowed to have a particular love for her. Actually, I should have a particular love for her. Just because <clears throat> we believe that our faith is true doesn't mean we hate every other world religion. Of course not. If I was born in Iraq, chances are I'd be Muslim. Okay? So it doesn't mean we hate other world religions, but we still can have the courage and conviction to say that what we believe is true. Now, okay, that's the unique selling point. We haven't really got to, we haven't really got to what the unique selling point of our faith is yet, <clears throat> which I think is really important for us to understand. Because we don't want this to turn into, this isn't about sectarianism or anything, but it's just about, let's look at facts. Okay? What is the unique selling point of our faith? In our faith, God reveals himself to us. God, this is what God says about himself. Okay, this isn't a spiritually wise or inspired guru um, who has some <clears throat> understandings about God, writes them down, followers join him and away we go. This isn't, this isn't the thought of man. This isn't the fruit of, of a bunch of people getting together and sitting down with their amazing intellects and, and putting together a faith. This is God revealing himself. And that's really, really important because it, it doesn't depend on me. This isn't my opinion versus yours. This is, this is what God says about himself. No other world religion claims to have uh, God revealing themselves. I mean, like, you know, is God a person or a, three persons in our case, right? Uh, is, or, or is he energy? It's not the same thing. You know, if I see, I see Nora there, like Nora, is Nora a woman or is she just, is she just kind of energy? But if she's just energy, that, that's very, very different. I can't say hello, good morning to energy. <laughs> you know? I mean, is our God a person or not? Is Jesus, was Jesus Christ a truly God, truly man or not? Did he die on a cross or not? Is everyone who's saved, saved through the cross or not? Is Jesus Christ the source of all grace or not? Is the Eucharist... Jesus' body, blood, soul, and divinity, or not. These things are really, really clear. That either they are or they aren't. But to say all world religions are the same is just plain rubbish. It's historical rubbish. It's theological rubbish. It's logical rubbish. Because they're not, they don't believe the same things. They can't all be the same. They can't all be equal. And some of them have really wacky ideas, which we won't go into. Okay. Point being, though, that our unique selling point, the reason people should be Catholic, and the reason we should have a desire that people will be Catholic is because here they receive the truth of how God reveals himself to mankind. This is what God says about himself. That's, it means it's solid. It means it, like the Pope can't go changing every belief. You know, I've met a number of people in recent months who say, yeah, the Pope can change this, or the Pope can change that, or he can change the sacraments, or whatever. It, it, just, it doesn't work. The Pope actually can't. There's a when it comes to the church's teaching, the Pope actually can't change it. He can clarify things, but he can't change church teaching. You can't say, well, the Bible says this, but I'm going to say this. You, you, you can't, the Pope can't do that. It's not within his power, right? 
It's not like a political party. So it's, it's not within his power. So the faith that the Lord reveals to us is solid. We can count on it. And that's what makes our faith so unique and so dependable and so beautiful. God speaks to us through his teaching. He speaks to us today through his gospel, through the words of our first reading, through the liturgy. The Lord will come and dwell within us in the Eucharist. When I think of how we should relate to other world religions, I often think of what Our Lady would do. You know, when Our Lady sees Muslims or Hindus or Buddhists, what does she think? I mean, she loves them. She wants them to know her son, though. She wants them to get to heaven. She wants them to, to be able to draw from, from all the graces available to us. But it doesn't mean she doesn't like them. Of course not. So with us, other world religions, we don't hate them. We want them to get to heaven. We want them to know the, the peace of, of, of the sacrament of confession, for example. We want them to know the grace of the Holy Eucharist. We want them to know God as he reveals himself. And so we ask our Blessed Lady today, the Mother of the Church, Queen of Heaven and Earth, to lead all of us and to lead all missionaries in their activity, that we may win souls for Christ, that we may win souls for Heaven. Amen.